Uh, this uh, new iPhone of mine has, hi, I'm Terry David Mulligan. Um, the, this new phone has got the, the cinematic uh, focus and things, but it doesn't take any years off. Never mind. Uh, let me let me tell you about what's going on with the Mulligan's Two podcast, the video version of the Mulligan's Two podcast on YouTube. Booker T. Jones Jr., the man who was and is Booker T. and the MGs, the heart and soul of Stax Volt, Staple Singers, um, Aretha, Eddie Floyd, Sam Moore. Rufus and Carla Thomas, uh, Albert King, and Otis Redding, of course. Worked with Dylan. It was actually in the band that uh, backed up Bob for his 30th anniversary concert at Madison Square Garden. Was the band leader behind Otis Redding when he walked on stage and absolutely stole the show at the um, Monterey Pop Festival. Huge implications there. Uh, is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I'm going to sit and talk to him for, well, 30, 30, 35 minutes. And he's going to tell stories, great stories. Um, I asked him about the most uh, uh, compelling person that he'd ever met, because he'd crossed a lot of paths. And he said, President Obama. And uh, he played the White House later. And... When Obama, the Obamas walk out in the room, the ballroom, you're supposed to play, the band's supposed to play uh, All Hail the Chief or whatever it's called. And, and President Obama said, no, 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 no. Play Green Onions. We're going to walk out to Green Onions. <laughs> and so this is a wonderful uh, conversation we're about to have right now. And it's, and it's uh, literally the culmination of many, many, many years of me playing this music and finally getting a chance to say thank you for doing it. Please welcome uh, to the Mulligans 2 podcast, the video version on YouTube. This is Booker T. Jones Jr., the man. I started by looking up your middle name. Yeah. I don't think I could say it right, and you don't use it a lot, if ever. Talio Ferro? Well, that's the way us Americans would say it. I went over there and said that, and they kind of laughed at me. I think they say Talio something like that, Talio and some Southerners even say Tolliver. Tolliver. I've heard that, Tolliver. Anyway, it's Italian for iron worker. There you go. Um, um, Booker T. Washington's middle name, the Booker T. Washington, the educator. Thank you. Mm. Uh, time is tight. Let me, uh, let me just ask you, first, no, first things first. For those folks who have bought tickets for this show and the ones who are thinking about it and having conversations over dinner about it, this show is your your 10-piece uh, stacks review show is that what you're bringing yeah that's what i'm bringing um I'm looking for my notes yeah it's um and you bring the stories the back review um it's, it's, the, it's the, the spirit of stacks records yeah and and you bring the stories with you <laughs> yes i do <laughs> <laughs> yeah lots of stories yeah mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but it's it, it's it's uh, it's it, it's a story of my life. You know, you you told me about how your your father sort of <laughs> boohooed you, but my father waited till three a.m. on clubs out in Arkansas, waiting for me and Maurice White and Richard Shan to come out of a club where we got about a uh, dollar seventy-five for playing. He waited out in his forty-nine Ford and took us home. So. But you weren't. But you weren't delivering newspapers. You were. You were on a stage. You oh know? no! The weren't delivering papers. On a stage, way over in West Memphis, and uh, those were my running buddies. Uh, they got me into music before I stepped through the doors at nine twenty six East Macklemore Avenue, which was yes. Satellite Records, looking for Ray Charles records. Ah, you know, I just finished. I just finished one of my shows, and it was on this date in nineteen. 59 that Ray Charles have recorded uh, uh what did I say yeah. he, was, he was he was he was, had run out of tunes on the road and so he just sort of made up this riff and he looked at the Ray Letts and the, the band and said just follow me and just oh. call him call him response call him response call him response and they did it and then he phoned Atlantic Records and said we uh we're doing this song out here there's no title for it but we think it, it could be recorded 
and they recorded it and became a huge hit and those are the kind of songs that, that people remember those stories that's a great story i'm so glad you told me that uh, that was that was uh, one of my anthems when i was a kid was trying to learn how to play that song and and of course I, I met you know the atlantic people and ray was in quincy jones's band playing ham and m3 organ which yeah. i heard that is what inspired me to play ham and m3 organ so that's a great story to hear thank you up like that on the road there just how uh, uh, some things happen by chance like for example uh, i'm going to go straight to it green onions was was you guys you were waiting for someone to show up billy lee uh, and it started with a riff from you? Yes, it did. No, 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 no. One, three, four. Yeah, from my theory class. Uh, uh, but but yeah, the groove um, is the uh, quintessential, I, I don't know if that's the right word or not, Memphis yeah. groove, though. That's the groove that I was playing probably about six or seven hours before that in a club on some other changes, because that's what the people dance to. That's what they liked. You know, they liked that rhythm. So anything you kind of put to that rhythm in Memphis would go over in a club. And you can't miss that beat. You can't miss that groove. That groove will lift you literally off the floor. And it was played by one of the originals, Al Jackson Jr. His dad had a big band, like, like Quincy Jones's big band. And they I heard them play like that at a kite contest when I was maybe seven, eight years old. And had a little kid drummer up on stage playing in his, da in his dad's band. And uh, that, that was just a great coincidence to end here's up. What I, here's what I remember about Al Jackson. First of all, he was so calm. Secondly, because I was used to rock and roll drummers who were just all over the place. Secondly, I can remember when he didn't need his right arm, he let it hang at his at his side and, and did his rim shots with his left hand. And then when oh, he did that right arm, he'd bring it back up again. I'd never seen anybody do that. What a stylish performer. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> a, that's another great story. I appreciate that, Terry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time on stage just watching him. Wow. Yeah. What did it take to? I mean, I know that when you, did, for example, Green Onions, when you laid that down, mm -hmm. when and we heard it, it was special to us. But for you, mm -hmm. in that studio, and later on, it was an exercise in in just fooling around. And you had the studios all set up and ready to go. You might as well do something. Um, when did it take on meaning for you, seriously? Well, it it it, uh, it took on meaning for me once I heard it on the radio. But the doing of it was Steve Cropper was telling me, well, you know, we've got to do something. We recorded this song. They won't let us put out put it out unless we have a B side. You know, we got to got to do something. So you know, let let's play something. You know, so we can have a B side. The the A side was Behave Yourself. Yeah. By Booker T and the MGs, and Cropper wanted to get it and take it down to the radio station. You know, everybody liked it. Thought, well, we finally made a record, and so uh, it was okay. Well, what can we do? What can we do? You know, and 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 that's how you know the Green Onions riff came up, and it kind of came up kind of like that Ray Charles song. We didn't know really what we were doing, but uh, so and and with Green Onions, we had a B side, so we had a record, and it's and you had some cash in your pocket. And and then uh, Jim Stewart, who inducted you into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, congratulations. Um, he um, he suggested you guys be the house band, uh, which also was going to put some cash in your pocket. You might have hesitated in becoming the house band, but it was a good move. Oh, hesitate? Are you kidding? I was in heaven, <laughs> in heaven, to be at a, in a house band playing after school, making seven dollars a day. Of fifth, sometimes up to fifteen dollars a day. That was a, that was a salary on the level of my my dad's, who was a math teacher at the high school. Ah, you could have been a great math teacher. Um, <laughs> now, uh, who was the first? Can you remember who was the first through the door? As as first, uh, which door are you talking about, Terry? Well, uh, Stacks, and uh, and when you were the house band, your first gig. I walked through the door on the heels of David Porter. My yeah. friend, my high school friend, who was in a, uh, he would he would sing on the street corners at night with with Maurice White, and they had a little group. And I guess he heard at a session that they needed an extra horn for a Rufus Thomas session, so he ran over to the high school and got me out of my algebra class to go down go down to the band room get the get the baritone sax, and got the band director's keys and rushed me over to my the destination I've been wanting to go to for for years was 926 East Macklemore and uh, walked right through the door. So I picked out my horn and 
And they were in E flat, which was convenient because the baritone sax is in E flat. The song was in E flat. And it was, the song was Cause I Love You by uh, Rufus and Carla Thomas. So just before I left, I told them, well, you know, I can play piano too, <laughs> by the way. So I started getting calls over there. And that, that's how I got through the door. You were prepared to do whatever they needed. I was, I was. I was. You would be a violin player if you had to. Um, um, I, I, I need excuses, of course, to play tracks. Yeah. Let's keep you, let's keep you in the uh, in the stack studio for just a second. Hang in there. Okay. Who was the most passionate in the studio? Um, the most passionate about the music, about the, about the final. John Stewart wasn't in the studio. He was in the control room or just around about. But he was the most passionate soul there. But he I can't, was, I can't play a Jim Stewart record. I'm, yeah, if oh, you the most passionate artist. Yes. I'll have to say Rufus Thomas. <laughs> Rufus Thomas was uh, music, music, music. Uh, he was passionate about how you looked, how you sounded, you, if you were on time, what key you were in, if you had a good attitude, and not shy about any of it. Who was the most joyous? The most joyous was Donald Duck Dunn. He was the bass player. He was happy to be there. Yeah. No matter what the scene. Yeah. Even when it was torture. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as he had his pipe, he was all right. Which, yeah. which artist was the most joyous? The singers. Which one? Of the singers? I have to give that to Otis Redding. Okay. He I just see. let go and he was, his spirit was in such a good place that if you were 10 feet around, you caught, you caught the virus. You, it showed, and it showed on stage too, didn't it? It did. It did. And that was the most, that was the most uh, contagious <laughs> it was when he was on stage because you, you, you watched him and he was dancing and he was just in love with the moment in love with what he was doing, in love with the audience. And uh, it was a, just a real pleasure to work with him. Booker, um, how did he handle fame, the fame that came to him very quickly? Uh, to be honest, I don't, to be brutally honest, I don't know if he did very well with, well with that part. Uh, you know, fame is can be a, a double-edged sword and I know that there were times when he was lonely and away from home by himself. And uh, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I understand. He, I, he, I, I remember Steve Cropper talking about um, the days following Otis's death in the plane crash. Mm -hmm. And you had Doc of the Bay recorded, if I'm not mistaken, or it was partially recorded, or he laid uh -huh. his. It was on tape, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you remember? This, I mean, those days uh, and those mm -hmm. moments, and, and then mm -hmm. getting that record out. What was yeah? That? It was near the holidays, and Otis was obsessed, uh, which means you had to be obsessed. And so we were in the studio. I don't know if we, you know, I just remember grabbing people, grabbing sleep in corridors, and not going home, and all at the behest of the king, Otis Redding. He was, we're not stopping now. We we're yeah. going to continue. It was crazy. It was insane, but. The joy of doing that particular song, I remember trying to come up with a nautical theme on the piano uh, to help it out, uh, was just, it was just, it was joyful. It was crazy. It was joyful. And then you heard it coming out, into, out of the radio, driving your cars, and everybody yeah. played it. Everybody. Yeah, yeah that, that was a transition time for me, too. Yeah, um, that was 1968. Yeah, yeah, we, hmm. yeah. By the way, uh, just in 1968 for a second, Sgt. Pepper had come out. Um, uh, the Beatles were everywhere. Uh, did they? Did you guys talk about them and, and the impact they were having and maybe the direction they were taking music? Yeah, the whole English movement caught uh, our ear, uh, Cropper, Otis in particular, and uh, I, I'm sure that they met and Otis wanted to do one of their songs and the whole guitar thing from over there, the whole... Uh, and the Beatles themselves were, when we went over there, were personally uh, very 
uh, accommodating and they came to visit us and came to our shows and uh so yeah it was it was a relationship and were you aware of the impact you were having on the, on the british music scene yes uh i was shocked at the crowds when we were going to go over i was shocked there was no tickets left there were there were the, the concerts were full and that was such a great feeling but it was such a surprise who was people were telling us how hard it was to get the records people were saying i can't get your records we have to go out uh, they were selling them offshore and and it was it was really it was really something who was the most spiritual in the studio singer artist who was the most what spiritual irritable spiritual what'd you say uh, spiritual spirit spiritual In other, words, John in other words, walk, walk the fine line between the church and, and stacks. This is this person I'm talking about, Mabel John. Her yeah. sister was, her brother was little Willie John, but she always had a spiritual air about her. She's actually a minister, or what she was last I heard. And she's the one that your good thing is about to come to an end. She was always uh, just a, a, a great spirit to be around. You could feel her goodwill, and she was nice. Uh, last last question. Who's the most? I, I think I know the answer. Uh, who was the most difficult in the studio? The most difficult artist. Dif difficult. Wilson Pickett. Yeah, of course. Wicked Wilson Pickett. Wilson Pickett was so. Uh, I don't know. I remember one morning he woke me up and uh, let, let's go shopping, Booker. We were in Hollywood, separate hotels, and took. Well, we had walked from Sunset Boulevard to Hollywood Boulevard to this wholesale shirt shop. And uh, he just, well, shirt after shirt after shirt. And, well, what are you taking back to the hotel? I ended up carrying the shirts back to the hotel. <laughs> so I thought I was, you know, hanging out with Wilson Pickett shopping, you know. He took me along so I, to have somebody to carry the shirts. <laughs> but he was, he was pretty, pretty steady, good, good, close friend to hang out with. Did you spend much time with the Staple Singers? Roebuck? Yes. Yes. Now, I maybe should have mentioned them as the most spiritual because I first saw them when I, on my paper out uh, at Mason Temple when I was throwing papers on uh, Fourth and Memphis. And the, the church door was open. I was maybe 20 yards from the, from the church, and I could see a group from the street with my paper sack on, uh, and they had robes, and th there was a guitar in the church. I don't know if you know about 1955, but a guitar in the church was not, that was kind of, and it was pop staples, and I could hear them. That sound, the that guitar yeah, sound. I could hear them through, the, through the door, and that was the staple singers, and I never thought I would get to meet them or be with them, but that's, and still is, probably the most uh, spiritual, and very strong spiritual influence from, from uh, Stax. And your time with Aretha? I'm sorry? Your time with you Aretha? Say? Aretha Franklin. I miss what you miss. I never met her. I, I've met her at, at shows on stage, but we were never together in Memphis. Okay. No. Right. You know, they 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 had a chance to sign Aretha, and I think they messed up the legal part of it or something and missed her. Uh, one more uh, artist because I I saw him many times. Albert King. Did you uh, did you work with Albert? I think I was possibly probably spiritually closest to Albert than any of the other artists. He came to Memphis. He was, heard he was coming to Memphis. He was one of the king, and he didn't have a song. And, and they said, can you, to me and William Bell, can you do something? So eight hours before the session in my den, midnight, we wrote Born Under a Bad Sign for <laughs> Albert King. Next morning, 10 o'clock, he's playing it, and he's playing it like, like I dreamt he would play it. It was a dream come true. And and so the friendship was just very subtle, but very steady. And um, and I would get a call from him every now and then just for years. I'll look in. Man, these, you know, these, these, this is a lot of memories for me. This, my life is just racing in front of my eyes here. It's it's an it's an amazing this yeah, is a cathartic, cathartic. this is very emotional for me because I've been playing all that music all these years 
hoping so. Yeah, and these these concepts I'm saying are in the music. It's in the music. You can hear it. That's great to hear. Yeah, especially with Elvis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and he was in C sharp minor, D flat blues, and D flat minor. Come on, wait a minute. What's going on here, <laughs> Albert? You know that emotion. He killed it from the first note, and just like just like we knew he would. And left handed. And left handed. I forgot about that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was, was he playing this flying V then? Was he I'm playing sorry? that flying V guitar? Was that what he was playing? Oh yeah, yeah. He had the big heavy guitar. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. A couple more so things. That was a beautiful memory I have there. Thank you. Uh, is this is it impossible to ask you to define a best single moment for you? Something that literally defines the road you traveled. One single moment. I think. Oh man, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. I. I I said to myself when I was driving down Macklemore Avenue, listening to Ray Charles play in Quincy's band, One Minute Julep, I heard the organ, I said, I think if I could do that with my life, if I could do what he's doing right now, if I could make a song, I would be a very happy man. And I remember that moment still, and I am a very happy man. But that came true for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really been great. Yeah. I've got dreams to remember. I've got to, it's, oh yeah, it's, you know, the, oh, you know, the, yeah, that was a gorgeous m moment there to hear him sing that because he was so honest and so sincere. You've crossed a lot of paths, a lot, on stage and off, just your own personal life. Most memorable person that you've met. That's a tough one. I was I was uh, inspired by Barack Obama. Wow. There was a there was a, a demeanor about him, uh, a dedication, and um, a lightness, a joyfulness, a sense of purpose, uh, uh, and and probably one of the bravest people I ever met. Did you get to meet him? Huh? Did you get What'd to you say? Did you get to meet him? Yeah, I met him on a couple occasions, uh, doing a benefit to raise money before he before he ran, and at the White House in the East Room. And he, uh, we were supposed to play. Uh, you know, normally when the president walks in, you play "Hail to the Chief." He said, "Booker, don't play Hail to the Chief. Play Green Onions for me." <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and we did. And he and uh, he and his wife bounced in the door. From Macklemore to the White House. Mm -hmm. From Memphis to the White House. Well done. That's right. That's right to the Eastern. You yeah. know, you you know, we are right. Booker, we are talking about your your legacy. We're talking about your legacy. Um and I don't mean I, I don't want to just beat this, but long after you and I are gone, the music that you've left behind. Mm -hmm. will stand the test of time. It's true. That's great to know. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, the music is, uh, it makes a palette for, for, for good things to happen and for people to feel good. And it's, you know, it, it, it it's a nice accompaniment to life. It's, it's a great thing to, to be involved in. I'm, 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 I'm happy to be a musician. And 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 lucky to be a musician as well, lucky, extremely lucky. There are so many musicians who are so uh, talented, uh, who are just there's just not room. They're just not getting their due. They're not being they're, they're, Well, that's a, that's that's a that's an unfortunate story. But but yeah, I'm very fortunate to make a living in the music business. Three moments in your life: your induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know you were uh, you were amazed by the building and everything that you saw in there. Do you like your place in it? Yes, that was an amazing moment. I thought maybe they had made a mistake. I thought my I thought my wife. I thought somebody had. Uh, are, you, are you sure? 
<laughs> the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So uh, yeah, that was that was a great honor, and um, and, and still and still is. So they and they they have been probably the most consistent institution of all uh, in the music business. They stay in touch. They take care of people. They don't. They, I mean, they, they're a real they're a real organization. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is. They you know they're there for you. Your good times, your bad times, and yeah, you know, it's it, it's a it's a it's a privilege to be a member. They usually ask you to leave something behind as a memento, like I mean, in, in the case of Jeff Beck, it would be a, a guitar or Clapton a guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you leave yeah. behind? You can't. Did you leave behind one of your organs? Yes, <laughs> the Hammond M3 organ with the good speaker and the great keyboard and all the great electronics is at the Stax Museum. And and that's probably the best place for it, but I wish I had it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like leaving a friend behind. Yeah. The rest of them are not the same. They don't play as well. <laughs> you may have to do it. It's good that it's there. It's protected there. Um, the, I, I, I remember being very impressed with Bob Dylan's 30th anniversary celebration at Madison Square Garden. Was, was it, do you remember moments of it yes i remember that show um bob comes to mind we were neighbors in malibu for a while and he brought uh certain songs over to test them out on me is this do you think this is any good <laughs> i'm sitting there with bob dylan and he says you think this is any good <laughs> mm, yeah but yeah, the show was great. Uh, there were moments with, uh, oh, uh, uh, the, the Irish, uh, Sinead O'Connor. Yep. And um, yep. I, I, she's changed her name and I forget her new name. Uh, there were moments, great moments on that stage. I was happy to be there. Mm -hmm. I like the reworkings of some of the songs, including Clapton's uh, Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. I just loved the, loved the way he handled that. It was and it was one of his best solos ever. Just the whole the whole who, night. Who was that? Oh, Eric Clapton that, yeah. uh, that we redid, redid the arrangement with? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, Bob's material is so, oh, man. so doable. And he's still going. He's still going. <laughs> he is, yeah. Uh, yeah, he I he, I had an electric guitar and I was running it through a, a, an old Craig amplifier and I, I turned it up and it made a distorted sound. He said, he liked that. He was crazy about that. So he was coming to my outhouse, my garage, to play my electric guitar through this for this distorted sound in, in 60 and in 69 because he liked the, and well, you know, and that's, and he finally ended up playing some, uh, some uh, uh, electric guitar. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um. The Monterey Pop Festival and, and and that whole show that you put on in Monterey Pop Festival, which really started the underground rock movement. Um, any thoughts on on that event and that moment? Yes, um, that was a um, a great moment for Otis uh, because uh, Otis yeah. realized his new audience. He realized uh, on a on a on a higher level, you know, new friends. Uh, made a, a lot of new friends backstage. Um, you know, yeah, that was uh, the United States was taking on a different uh, atmosphere and look as after that day, and um, that was a how do you say re a revelation in a way about what was what was going on politically and musically in the in the country and in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack Bruce, yeah, he came and spent time with me and talked to me, and we talked music backstage, and uh, there was a lot of mingling among the music musicians backstage at Monterey, and everybody was listening to everyone's show, so it was a, it was a great time. Jimi Hendrix, Janice, wow. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, this show that you bring uh, to Calgary next week, the uh, the twenty fifth. Uh, I wonder. I know it's another Saturday night for you. You're up on stage. You got your band. 
is the nuts and bolts of just putting you on on stage, getting everybody there on time and, and safe. Once the mm -hmm. music starts, once it sets itself in motion, mm -hmm. can you still get carried away by it? Oh. Yeah. That's what you can't buy. <laughs> when, when that happens, when that happens, I have this singer from New York, Diana, and she may just glance at me and I'll glance back and we know that we've made it. We're, we're on the ship and the music is carrying us. And there's, that's priceless when that happens. A lot of times it happens with a staple singer's song or, uh, or uh, we, we do... Uh, we do Eddie Floyd's "Knock on Wood." We do we do the Stax stuff. We do um, uh, Booker T and MG's "Extended Time Is Tight," and uh, yeah, the, and when the music just picks you up and takes you, and that's just a great thing to happen. It's just it's a great feeling, and that happens with this show. If so, you could, it wouldn't matter how much. No, go ahead. If you could have anybody up on stage with you while the band was going cooking and everything was working. Who would you love to see walk out and join you on stage? Hmm, whoever I wanted. Oh, well, I'm I know. Old, I know. So that's a, I, know. That's I got tough. it. I got it. It's got to be Ray Charles. Ray? Oh my God! Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because he 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 flew on stage. He he was what? Yeah, he was the essence of of feeling good inside of music yeah he, he you knew that he was having a great time and, uh, yeah he was the master he uh yeah the way i play is so much influenced uh, by him and and um and his band and his band members and hank hank crawford so a number of them from memphis henry cooper uh, yeah okay um the uh, there, uh, did I read somewhere that that, that uh, there's a new Stax box set coming out? I didn't know that. Is there a documentary coming? I'm sorry. Would you say a film documentary coming? I don't know about that. A new Green Album, Green Onions album is coming. I have reimagined the song as a Latin salsa and recorded it. And I have reimagined it as a country song and as a jazz song and uh, as a reggae song. And that's coming out. That's done. That, that, that's been fun. I, I missed the first part of that. Are you saying that you, that you did huh? all those versions yeah. with Green Onions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Green Onions is the first. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the 60th anniversary. This is thank I'm, I'm 78 years old. I just, and um, so the, can you, can you believe? Green Onions is 60 years old. <laughs> so yeah, I went in with my son and my band and and some great, uh, great musicians and we've got some new music. I'm glad you're coming yeah. out and playing. I mean, how many dates will you do this year? What? How busy do you want to be on the road? That's a good question. I think probably around 30, 50, something like that. I'm not really sure what the number is. It, it varies because we were off we were, for two years. We were not playing. So, uh, it's slowly picking up. Did you watch the Grammys? I did. Do you recognize the music? Well, no. I was I was so glad to see uh, Bonnie Raitt there. Bonnie Raitt took the words right out of my mouth. Bonnie Raitt. I was I was so uh, inspired that she wrote a song and recorded it, recorded it, and uh, she did such a great job of it, and that it won. I know the I know the parameters are different, you know, uh, for the voting and who can win. But it's, she's, you know, I was just for me that was the moment of, of the Grammys. And I still I take it have to have to watch the whole show. I haven't watched the whole thing, but I saw her there. So that was good. <laughs> and and there's and there's no fluffery around here there's no f big show around her she is her, her it's her guitar it's her voice it's her passion the the, the basics mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and the story and the story now 
The interview I did just before you was with David Landreth. Uh, with who? The Landreth, the Landreth brothers, the Landreth brothers in Winnipeg, Manitoba, met Bonnie seven years uh, seven years uh, previously, and she asked for one of their songs, and she sent it. Uh, they sent it to her, and that was the first single off the album "Made Up Mind." So when she won the second Grammy for a best uh, Americana song, that was the Landreth Brothers song from Winnipeg, Manitoba. It took them seven years from the time they handed off to the time the thing got recorded and became the first single. And um, so everybody wins. Everybody wins with Bonnie Raitt. Everybody. That's, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That was a good moment for me. Thank you for bringing your music out here. You know that. Oh, you're very welcome. That's that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to do that. Last question. Mm -hmm. Can music heal? Here's uh, unequivocally, yes. Uh, yes. I'll, I'll give you my full perspective. Yes. Throughout the annals of time, music does heal, can heal, did heal, will heal. That's, that's my opinion. Thank you. I happen to agree with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. And thank, thank you. you. Huh? Thank you. It's thank good you. to meet you. Thanks for calling. Nice to finally meet you, sir. And, and hopefully... Hopefully, you, hopefully what? Hopefully we can meet up at some point, maybe. Ah, oh, man. If you get anywhere near me, I'm coming. I'll find you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. I look forward to it. Thank you, buddy. All right, Thank my you. friend.